And then here comes the NWA in the fall of 1988 and into 1989. And talk about bum rushing the show. I mean, they just, just smashed down the door. Straight out of Compton, it's a crazy brother named Ice Cube. From the gang called niggas with attitudes. When I'm called off, I got a sword off. Squeeze the trigger and body's all hard off. When I first heard Straight Outta Compton, yo, I really thought that Ice Cube was gonna f*** me up. They was the first ones to actually break that chain and say, we ain't gonna make no hip-hop, you know, nice records. We making records by getting our dicks. Police, we shoot. Whoa, 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 whoa. NWA was like the first gang on record. Straight out of Compton, that was like going on a drive by. And the whole attitude of the record was just you. You could claim that Straight Out of Compton is the most influential album in the history of hip hop. They definitely changed the kinds of things that people were talking about on records and also changed the language that people used. It was ass bitch. Like it was, you know, ridiculous. And I was like, oh. We just went in there to make records, to have fun with it, and just say the wildest shit that we could say on the record, and do whatever we want to do. And now that, that was that. That's how the group came about. What is your group now? NWA. And what does that stand for? Niggas with attitudes. The name of the group is not NWA. It's niggas with attitude. Now, can you stomach that, America? I think NWA was brilliant to say we're NWA. It's the biggest f you ever, and it's not just a f you to white people. It's a f you to black people. It's saying, yeah, we niggas. So you don't have no more power. <laughs> it's like you're finished with that. That was the first time I'd ever heard the word nigger from a standpoint of power. When something happens in South Central Los Angeles, nothing happens. It's just another nigga dead, dead, dead. NWA, of course, starts in Compton. I mean, you have Eric E.Z. Wright, who was one of these kids that the, the capitalistic urge was always there. E.Z. was definitely a hustler, top to bottom. I never intended to rap in my life. I had a little money, I started a record company, and ended up rapping about stuff that I've been through. Dre was good as a producer. Ice Cube was a good writer and rapper. Randy was a strong rapper and writer. And Yellow was a producer. And then myself. And that's the way Easy does it then. What we would do at the time is take the popular song that was out, redo it and make it dirty. I can remember us doing My Adidas, you know. We redid the beat and changed it to My Penis. You know, and Cube would go out there and sing that and have the crowd laugh and you know, that's basically how NWA came about. We performed in some of the raunchiest places in Compton. I've seen guys come out the audience and walk on the stage and, and beat the artist down that's on stage because they looked at it like, you know, you made me waste my money. You had to be good or else. I came from Compton, that's what I wanted to talk about, Compton, you had everybody from New York rapping about my Adidas and my chain, this and this and South Bronx and everything, I wanted to put my city on the map, I'm from Compton. It was people that lived in Compton that were embarrassed to say they were from Compton, we just wanted to let everybody know where we were from and that we were proud to be from there. The records we do, you know, it involves a lot of gangbangers because that's just a reality of the street. And out here in L.A. and Compton. Being around N.W.A. was the first time there were a lot of guns around. You know, made me clap your hands. Guys going out on stage and getting strapped to go out on stage. We didn't have that before at N.W.A. I do look kind of bland though. Find the red dot. We just took it to another level. And just told it how it was, you know, without holding back. Remember that many of the songs, one in particular started off, what the is up, who the is he coming on the mic, is he me? That isn't exactly the kind of songs that were being played on the radio in, in America at that time. If we had went into it going, you know what, we have to make a record that's going to get played on the radio, we would have failed. We were just making records as just something for us to listen to, something just for us to make a little money on. You know, we had no idea it was going to blow up the way it did. They were selling a lot of records locally. Then when Easy meets Jerry Heller, he said, because this is so controversial, this is so dangerous, there's going to be a market for this. I took straight out of Compton to the chairman of the board of Capitol Records, 
he looked at me and he said, you better stop getting high on whatever you're getting high on because this is too crazy. It was something that was very frightening to the establishment. Police coming straight from the underground. A young got it back because I'm brown. Public Enemy opened the door to the expression of sustained anger in rap. N.W.A. blasted past Public Enemy. The really interesting thing about N.W.A. is straight out of Compton was much more in the spirit of the Black Panthers than what Public Enemy was doing. Really, for N.W.A., it was about power. It was more about, this is what we're dealing with with these cops and with everything else, and I don't have a message, but I'm mad, and I'm, I'm doing something about it. No more beings in our community. No more beings in our community. Police are there in our community not to uh, promote our welfare, or uh, you know, for our safety. They're there to protect us. Not to protect us. Not to protect us. Not to protect us. Not to protect us. Or uh, for our security and our safety, but they're there to contain us, um, to uh, brutalize us and murder us. Instead of f the pigs, they said f the police. Those records were highly political. But take off the gun so you can see what's up and we'll go at it, punk, and I'm a f you up. We was just letting everybody know that black people was fed up with getting harassed by the police and getting beat by them. Sometimes I want to kick the out of them because they've been having me face down. Police pulled up now and they saw my friends just having fun behind me. No, they'd probably break it up or whatever. But you know, they ask, man. That was in everybody's hearts. That's what we felt, you know, being 17, 18 years old with a new car. You can't, you can't drive two blocks without getting stopped. The reason why we made that song, we were at a mall one time. And Easy had a skirmish gun that shoots paintballs. And I can remember driving a Samurai Suzuki Jeep. And Easy was in the passenger seat. And him leaning out the window, shooting people on bus stops. He was getting a kick out of people bugging out because it was red paint. People were actually thinking they were shot, you know. A couple of miles down the road, and about 50 police cars later, we're face down in the street, you know, with guns to our head. We left that incident and went to the studio and cut that song. Police. That's the way it goes in the city of Compton, boy. Because of that record, there was a FBI memo that was written about the song and the fact that it, you know, depicted people shooting the police and everything else. Once it made the papers and once the name group got out there, record sales just skyrocketed. I knew Straight Outta Compton was humongous when we got the letter from the FBI. It was very frightening to me. Here's the top law enforcement official in our country telling us that we're responsible for the deaths of 89 law enforcement officers in the United States of America. I'm like, whoa, okay. We touched a nerve. Now let's see what else we can do. We make our records based on stuff that's happening where we live, you know. And people out there that don't like it, them. People don't want to give rappers the courtesy of saying that they are artists and they are a step or two away from what they create. And certainly rappers played into that because it sold records. I've been through all, all the stuff, whether it was a dope dealings, a gang banging, uh, whatever. We already could see it was wrestling. I mean, when you fit outside of it, you can see it was wrestling. Come with us, we're getting ready to go over here and blow up a car. People inside of it were, you know, bought it as you know, this is ghetto reporting. And to some degree it was, but it, let's be true. Unless you're the biggest drug dealer in the world, how many stories do you have? Ice Cube was going to University of Arizona when he's writing these rhymes. Here's a little something about a brother like me. Never should have been let out the penitentiary. With the exception of Easy, I don't think any of them had criminal records. I don't even think Easy had a criminal record. So it wasn't like these guys were actually living the lives that they were portraying on these records, but they did it so effectively on these records that it seemed real. It's no different than the news. The news, we just telling it like it is, not holding back and using the explicit lyrics. It's like being an underground reporter. But ultimately, I met, every time I met Easy e he was laughing. Easy e was laughing because he knew he was making paper and it was all funny to him. We'll be right back with MTV, Easy e NWA, and the whole Ruthless Posse. Hello, Dr. Dre, oh, yo, MTV. <laughs> when Ice Cube and NWA were making their records, their main concern was South Central Los Angeles black community. I don't think they really realized how much impact these records would have. Yo, I'm Easy e And we're NWA. Rolling down Compton Boulevard on your MTV raps. For the white suburban kid, you finally had a record that would scare your parents. 
NWA was the best. You know, I loved it. I remember sitting in Florida at my grandma's house, lying out in the sun with my headphones on, just like playing a tape over and over again. I loved it. I remember we went to Kentucky. It was the first day of our tour, and the audience was 80% white. You know, we were like, yo, are they in the right place? You know? <laughs> But we went out there, girls were pulling the shirts off, that NWA wrote on their chest, and it was wild. They went crazy. Come on, come on. They do this huge tour. They go all over the place. Millions of fans making all this money for somebody. Cube comes back and he's driving a Suzuki sidekick. His check from all that was thirty-two thousand dollars. And he's like, wait a minute. The tension began when we were on a tour. Easy E. Jerry Heller comes backstage and offers them contracts, and he offers each member of the group $75,000. We looked at these checks like, whoa, you know, nobody has seen that much money at once, you know? So they were like, but you, you know, you guys are not officially a group yet because we had never signed anything up to that point. Everybody else signs. Q says, wait a minute, I want a lawyer to look at this. A big argument happened, and, you know, we were looking at him at the time like, you know, you're turning your back on the group. I caught. Jerry Heller, Easy e hand in the cookie jar, and I was willing to say, you know, f it, I caught y'all, you know, just pay me what you owe me and we can keep on rolling. But, you know, they wanted to save face. They felt like after they paid me, they would have to pay everybody else. And, uh, you know, so they was kind of pretty much like, f you, what you gonna do, go solo? He walks away with nothing. He leaves Los Angeles, comes to New York, and actually starts recording with the Bomb Squad, the Public Enemies production team, and makes America's Most Wanted. Hey, yo, here's what the poster read. Ice Cube is wanted dead. That's all it said. That was some of our primary goals when we helped produce Ice Cube's first album, is to break down the barrier between East Coast and West Coast. Ice Cube, that's one of the most incredible men who ever touched the microphone. But when I start robbing the white folks, now I'm in the pen with the soap on the rope. I said it before and I still call it every motherfucker with a color is most wanted. He managed to become even more political. The name of the album is America's Most Wanted with three Ks. He is evolving. Another homie got murdered on a shake. Yeah, you know, they know the, the gun problem in the, in the black community, but they'll set up five or ten gun shops in the black community selling weapons that nobody's going to ever need. I'm waiting for them to start selling tanks. And while Ice Cube is evolving, NWA is devolving. They're going into an even more gangster direction. Sitting in my lap as I roll up the Compton blocks. The scoop up ran, I heard shots. One, two, three, then I say ran. Hop in the fence and with the 45 inside his hand. Niggas for Life pushes everything to the edge. Musically, the record is absolutely amazing. In terms of the lyrics, they go from having a semblance of political meaning and content to going to some of the most misogynistic, violent lyrics ever committed to tape. That record all of a sudden is selling faster because of the controversy. It just keeps building and building and building. Is there a positive side to gangster rap and what is education? Just like we did at F the police. That's something people wanted to say for years. We said it. And it took it to Rodney King got beat for everybody to open their eyes. When that Rodney King beating was caught on tape, I thought the same way that everybody else did. This is f***ed up. I mean, it was horrendous. It was like what happened to black people in America for hundreds of years. We were all going like this. But only because we saw it on TV. Not because we were so shocked like, oh my God, is a cop beating a black man? Shocking. No, it wasn't that. It was like, is a cop beating a black man on TV? This isn't NYPD blue? Like, what the hell is going on? They got these, we, that's what, they like, they, 
They got these white boys. These white boys are going to jail. The Rodney King trial had been going on, and the words you would hear on the street in L.A. was like, yo, B, if the verdict don't, don't come down right, it's going to be some shit. But that was just like a buzz that I had heard from a couple of people. We, the jury, find the defendant, Lawrence M. Powell, and the defendant, not Timothy E. Wynn, like not guilty of the crime, and it was Sixteen people are dead, hundreds others injured in violence gripping the nation. It comes after the acquittal of four white police officers accused of beating a black motorist. We definitely knew there was a lot of tension down here and we tried to explain it to people but nobody wanted to listen. The records were telling you that it was crazy out there. They weren't exaggerating as much as we thought. Because the exposure of anger, the unemployment, just the festering frustration that you find on all those records, it all communicates that sense of chaos and isolation that really came up in the riots in 92. The way this LAPD was operating pre this situation, they needed to get killed because they uh, definitely were savage and they were worse than any street gang in Los Angeles.